Right. Welcome, everyone, to another edition of our Conversations in Environmental Communication series at the Program on the Environment at the University of Washington. <clears throat> As always, this uh, series is brought to you by the Program on the Environment, and um, we've got a fantastic lineup today. I'd like to start, though, by saying, or by just sort of uh, acknowledging the land. The University of Washington acknowledges the Coast Salish peoples of this land the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. While we meet today on a virtual platform, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of lands, which we all and each call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of local indigenous peoples and their cultures. So please feel free to take a moment there. Um, as I mentioned, we do have a fantastic lineup today of environmental journalists from uh, a variety of different backgrounds and a great wealth of experience. Uh, we have Ashley Braun joining us, uh, Bellamy Palethorpe, and Hannah Weinberger. Thank you each for, for joining us. And I'd love for our audience to give them a, a, a digital round of applause for, for taking the time out of their days to, uh, to be with us today. Um, as a reminder, we are broadcasting uh, live on YouTube and we have our students here joining us on the Zoom as well. What we're going to be doing in a minute, I'm gonna introduce our speakers and they'll have some remarks to start us off with and then we'll, we'll open it up to a student-driven Q&A. Uh, and if you are joining us from the YouTube, you can chat your questions there uh, on YouTube and I will ask those questions of you. If you're in the Zoom with us though, um, feel free to either use the chat to chat your questions to our speakers or if you'd rather use the reactions button and raise your hand under the reactions, you can raise your, your virtual hand and, uh, and then I will call on you and uh, you can ask your question directly, which I think would be fantastic. It's a great way to start the conversations. All right, so let me just very briefly introduce our three illustrious speakers. I'll start with, I'll, I'll go alphabetically. Ashley Braun is a Seattle-based freelance science and environmental journalist whose reporting has taken her from Australia's Great Barrier Reef to the United Nations Climate Summit in Morocco. Her writing, which spans the ethics of gene editing for conservation, underwater killer robots, which is a fantastic story, and the controversial pebble mine in Alaska, has appeared in publications such as Long Reads, Science, The Atlantic, and Hakai Magazine. She also serves as a senior editor for the climate and energy investigative news site, Dismog, and as a fact checker for Science News and Discover Magazine. She graduated from the University of Notre Dame with a degree in environmental science. So let's have a, a round of applause for Ashley, please. The virtual applause are just raining in, right? Raining in. Our next panelist, Bellamy Palethorpe, covers the environment beat for the Seattle offices of KNKX Public Radio News. She has worked since 1999. She holds a master's in journalism from New York's Columbia University, where she completed the Knight Bagot Fellowship in business reporting. She lived in Berlin, Germany, freelancing for NPR and working as a bilingual producer for Deutsche Welle TV after receiving a Fulbright scholarship. And she is fluent in German, which is fantastic. I took German in high school and I only remember about three phrases. So we can communicate for about 20 seconds. Um, she holds a bachelor's degree in German language and literature from Wesleyan University of Middleton, Connecticut. She strives to tell memorable stories about how we, how, um, how we uh, power our future while maintaining healthy cultures, cultures and livable cities. Character-driven narratives of exploration are what really excite her and I'm excited to talk about that with her today. So let's give her a big round of applause too. Virtual applause and some real ones for me and the rest of our panel. And last but certainly not least, Hannah Weinberger is a reporter at Crosscut. That's part of KCTS 9 PBS in Seattle, focused on science and environment coverage. 
She writes about outdoor recreation, natural resources, natural disasters, wildlife management, environmental and health sciences, and similar arenas in which tension arises between society and the environment. And the consequences of treating those worlds as separate. Anna believes outdoor sports and field sciences are powerful vehicles through which to learn about the outdoors and that educated guesses and the confidence to follow them lead us to some of the most valuable lessons about nature and ourselves. And let's go ahead and give Hannah a big round of applause as well. So thank you all for being with us today. And um, I, I just wanna give you each an opportunity to uh, give us your thoughts to start us off uh, today. Um, you can start with whatever you'd like. And if there are any particular topics that you are extra, you know, extra excited to talk about today, maybe you could um, you know, pique our interests. And uh, then once we've gone through those brief intros, we'll open it up for Q&A. Does that sound good? That sounds good to me. Ashley, you wanna start us off? Sure, thanks again, Sean, for inviting me to speak with um, all the students today. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, as you mentioned, um, I <clears throat> um, um, graduated from the University of Notre Dame where I studied environmental science. Um, so I, I do not have a journalism degree. Um, I, did, uh, I did start to figure out that I was interested in journalism um, more so than science sort of later in my undergraduate career and, and started taking a few journalism classes at that point. Um, and after that, after graduating, I moved to Seattle to take an internship with um, the nonprofit environmental news outlet, Grist, which is based in downtown Seattle. Um, and that was sort of my, um, my entree into environmental journalism. Um, and from there, I, I actually took a, a brief break from, well, a brief, I took a five-year break from journalism um, where I worked um, as a web editor doing communications and social media, um, running a blog, that kind of a thing for um, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, um, NOAA, which is a US federal science agency. And, um, and during that time, I was also freelancing um, for various science publications on the side. Discover Magazine was one that I was working with, Natural History Magazine as well. Um, and in 2016, I left my job with NOAA and um, embarked on a full-time freelance uh, journalism career. And um, since then, uh, my mix of work has been sort of um, writing and reporting, editing and fact-checking, um, mostly for science and environmental publications that are um, typically sort of national or international in um, scope and audience. Um, I, I'm, as you mentioned, an editor with uh, the climate and energy news site, DSMOG. So that's um, part of what I'm doing, but also, um, you know, get insights into other people's um, science reporting through um, science and environmental reporting through my fact checking work, which I'm happy to answer questions about as well. Um, and of course, do my own writing and reporting on a range of issues um, for a range of publications. And a lot of the reporting that I've been doing the last couple of years, in particular for Hakai Magazine, um, which is a digital magazine focused on coastal science, um, has been around the Pebble Mine, which is a proposed copper and gold mine in Southwest Alaska that um, is near the headwaters of basically the last really like thriving, healthy sockeye salmon, um, wild sockeye salmon fishery um, in the world. And that has been a very controversial project. Um, and I've been reporting on sort of the science and the permitting process um, over the last um, almost two years. So um, happy to answer questions about that as well. So environmental policy is definitely a part of what I cover as well. But um, yeah, it's just a little bit about me and um, the type of, uh, the type of things that I do. So thanks again for having me. Fantastic, thank you. That, uh, that opens up a, a, a whole range of things for discussion, so appreciate it. Bellamy, would you like to go next? Unmute myself. Um, yeah, the pebble. <laughs> um, so I'm really a local journalist um, and a radio journalist. Those are the two things that kind of uh, define my work more than anything else, and I happen to be on the environment beat. Um, as mentioned with my biography, 
actually, I've been at, at Can KX, which was previously KPLU. Um, I think I got my 20 year pin recently, which is, <laughs> um, I never Great. thought stay so long, but I'm from the Northwest and I love living here and I love public radio and there aren't a whole lot of jobs in public radio. Um, and we're kind of the underdog in the market or have been. And uh, I like it. I like the people. Um, and I've managed to kind of move around enough with my projects that I've been able to keep it interesting. So on the Pebble Mine, for example, a story that I did a while ago, um, I'd have to look it up, but it was uh, took place at the Burke Museum where a number of tribes joined. Um, were you there, Ashley? We were probably in the same room together. Yeah, um, where there was a signing of, of the, um, I think it was a memorandum of understanding or an agreement that the tribes here would support um, the indigenous people in the area of the Pebble Mine in their fight to prevent that mine from going in. And um, you know, and I'm not a fact checker the way that Ashley is, but just talking to people, um, the way in which that project was canceled under the Clinton administration and then brought back in under the last administration, it's just very clear that there wasn't a lot of respect for science and um, the just the contrast in the the regard for process, they brought it back through the Army Corps of Engineers and um, you know, lots of science people told me that there was just kind of blatant disregard for um, the permitting process. Um, and anyway, so that's, that's a story that a lot of us on this beat have covered. Um, those fish are important. They're um, you know, economically important for the region. So that's, that's a big part of you know, being a resource dependent economy in many of our tribes. Um, have treaty rights to those fish. So they have particular legal coverage, uh, legal leverage, I should say. Um, so yeah, just to back up a little bit, um, I went to Wesleyan University and uh, we didn't have a radio station or sorry, a television station there. And I was really into theater, <laughs> um, but there was a radio, a student radio station and a public radio reporter there who was willing to take a group of us on as interns to put together a public radio program and really encouraged our interest in radio news. And this was back in the day of reel to reel. So um, we were cutting and splicing tape. I mean, it was, it was old fashioned. <laughs> um, and I really loved radio though. We did have a, a newspaper there, but I was less interested in that because you get so much information through the tone of a person's voice, um, the way they speak, the words they choose, where the emotion goes in their voice, and that leads to the quotes that you pick, even when you're doing print. Um, and so I got kind of hooked on radio at an early age, and then I had majored in German and got a Fulbright to go study theater science in Berlin and happened to get there right as the Berlin Wall was coming down. So that was a fascinating time to be over there. I learned so much, um, was there almost a decade and then came back via New York City, eventually got the job at, at KPLU at the time. Um, and you know, I'd worked as a television producer in Berlin as well, but I just couldn't shake my love of radio because a picture is worth a thousand words. And if you don't have a good picture, it's really hard to do television well and to do video journalism well. So. Um, it's a really nice happy medium, I think, um, to be able to work with audio. It's very evocative. Um, and I shared a, a clip with, with your professor who, um, I, I wonder if he shared it with the group, but about um, the shutdown of the Razor Clam Dig, which I think is a good example of how you can really use sound to transport people in their minds. You know, it's, it's um, you just need a little bit of sound of you know, sound of the wind and sound of the ocean to get you feeling like you're out there along with a few choice words to, to sort of set a scene. Um, so I, I just love radio. And you know, um, I, I covered the business beat for quite a while. Um, and I found that really fascinating because you know, money makes the world go round on some level. <laughs> and there's a lot of innovation and particularly here with um, the tax structure as it is, we get a lot of, of inner innovators in our, in our midst. Um, and I, I think people coming up with ideas and making money off of them are fascinating. Um, but when I got the chance to switch to environment, it, it didn't take me long to decide to do it because 
really in my heart, I've always loved this place for its natural resources. And one of the great things about the job is that you get to learn all the time. And so, um, you know, I'm not trained in environmental science, um, but I get to ask all these questions all the time. And, you know, my curiosity gets, gets stoked every day by the new things that I learn. Um, and I get to share those with the audience and figure out what are the choice things to, to share. The hard part is that most of my pieces have to be very short, especially the ones for radio newscasts. Um, and it's kind of a mixed blessing that we have the web because I can, you know, fill that with as many words as I want to if I can get it done on time. Um, but I, just lastly, I wanted to say, you know, what am I trying to do? Do I have an agenda as an environmental um, reporter? Um, my agenda is to tell memorable stories that teach you something and make you care, or at least make you more curious about the place where you live or the world that you're in. And, um, you know, I don't want to spoon feed you the answer. I want you to listen and learn and ask more questions. So I'm kind of fanatic about putting as many links as I can that I think might be useful into a story. Cause I'd like you to, if you're curious enough to look at it I'd like you to have the tools to research it a bit more yourself. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's the main thing. I would say um, the clamming story is a good one because it's an example, a tangible example of how a warming atmosphere is affecting our local culture. And um, it's pretty clear that a warming ocean is causing this, uh, these algal blooms. And, um, and it has very tangible effects on, you know, both indigenous cultures and Washingtonians, um, generally speaking. And I think the piece conveys that. Um, lately, I've also been covering the debate over the whale watching boats and whether they should have a regulation that creates a season or not. I know Hannah's written a lot about the whales as well. Um, and, you know, that's just been an amazing and fascinating story because those whales are just, you know, once you start getting to know them, you will fall in love with those whales. You can't help yourself the way they sound. The, the, the structure of their society. I mean, I'm sure there are people who don't feel that way, but I have to say, I was skeptical at first because I think that we fall for the charismatic megafauna. It's easy to love something big and cute. Um, and it's been a downfall of the environmental movement that we've paid more attention to those critters sometimes than we have to human health. Um, but those whales are precious and it's a really good avenue in and a way of getting people to care generally as well. And so, and then the last thing that I'm really focused on right now, because I mean, for obvious reasons, what's going on around us with Black Lives Matter and what, whatever else is um, equity. And I've watched and written about uh, our state trying hard to get a carbon policy in place for years now. And we just can't seem to do it. We are a very progressive state and we cannot seem to do it. You know, it's, it's fascinating. I did a recent story about um, concern about offsets, you know, licenses to pollute. <laughs> How do you regulate companies? Um, it's, it's very difficult um, and yet it, it needs to be done. Great. Thank you very much for that, Bellamy. Yeah, that's a, there's a whole lot there that we can dig into. Um, I'm excited for, for that. By the way, uh, Bellamy mentioned a story. Um, I did share it with the class beforehand, but I also included it in the chat for anybody who's curious about that link, um, the one about the toxic algae. Uh, well, Hannah, can you go ahead and share with us? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Hannah Weinberger. I'm the science and environment reporter at Crosscut uh, down the street from all of you in regular times. Right now we're all reporting from the ether, but still pretty locally. Um, I have been reporting ever since I got out of school, which wasn't what I thought I was going to do. Um, I actually have a degree in Mandarin Chinese um, and I uh, have always appreciated writing, but I didn't realize that was what I wanted to do until well into my undergraduate career. Um, I've always been really passionate about wildlife and I loved spending time outside, but I wasn't you know, really extreme or outdoorsy. Um, and I, I fell into environmental reporting 
through a lot of serendipity. Um, I, I love, you know, drawing people into stories and making them feel things they haven't themselves experienced and prompting reflection on why the world is the way it is. And a class in journalism that I took my uh, sophomore year made me realize I could do that as a career. Um, I took a class on environmental reporting that made me realize environmental reporting doesn't need to be about the environment in a vacuum, uh, but noticing how it functions on the sidelines of our lives. Um, I did a post undergrad fellowship reporting on the Colorado River and dams that really hooked me uh, because it opened my eyes to how our lifestyles are unsustainable and that we need to better understand where our lives meet and blend into the outdoors. Um, and you know, that the experiences that we have outdoors can foment a better appreciation for them, uh, that we don't live in separate spheres. I fell into jobs at outdoors focused magazines uh, because of my sustainability focus and grew to appreciate the value that outdoor recreation can have in helping people appreciate the outdoors and ultimately eventually want to conserve them for their own sake and not just our own. Um, but through it all, some of the stories that have inspired me the most have been about the emotional side of science and the environment. Um, the huge risks that people take to better understand the world, uh, the relationships we develop with our surroundings, the hubris we have in engaging with the planet uh, and the unanticipated domino effects of that hubris. Um, and through physical and mental sweat, people try to better understand something that we assumed we understood. Uh, our, our whole lives are a big experiment in this huge outdoor petri dish. Um, so uh, I, I'm also very interested in stories, you know, as Bellamy uh, noted, that have to do with who gets a say in how we make changes to the environment and whose experiences are highlighted and whose hardships get to be made a focus. Um, so I, I'm really passionate about equity, which is another reason that I ended up where I am today, which is at CrossCut. Um, so when I moved to Seattle a few years ago for a remote reporting job, I realized the value of reporting on the place in which I live. I'd been reporting for national publications where um, I got to do some really cool reporting, often topic-based, but I couldn't always feel the impact on the ground of the work that I did. And I wanted to give back to the community that I called my home uh, and interact directly with the community that I covered, something that's a little harder to do in the pandemic, but we're finding ways. Um, I gradually found my way back to environment explicit reporting roots, and that's allowed me to spend time on stories that I don't have a degree in, but I'm constantly drinking from the fire hose. I get to learn about new things every week. And um, you know, my job is kind of a generalist one one person science and environment beat reporter um, is that I am constantly challenged to learn new things, make connections between different spheres in the environment and um, try to help people who also aren't specialists appreciate the multiple ways that our environments function and how we relate to that, so. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you for that, Anna. Wow, I really do appreciate you sharing your perspective with us to get us started. And that was a whole lot for us to sort of take in, talk about drinking from the fire hose, so to speak. There's a, there's a lot of really great information there. And so at this point, I would love to turn it over to our students and to our audience. Uh, if you have questions for any of our speakers today, please go ahead and either type them into the chat or raise your digital hand. In the case of those of you in the Zoom, you can raise your digital hand under the reactions key and ask your questions of our audience. For those of you joining us from YouTube, you can type your questions into the chat there. I see we already have a hand up. Rose, would you like to ask your question? You can feel free to turn on your camera if you'd like. Yeah, hi. Um, my question is specifically for Ashley, but if you guys, if uh, Hannah and Bellamy also would like to touch on it. Um, my question is, what's the most impactful thing that we as environmental communicators can do or say when faced with someone spreading climate change and misinformation? 
Yeah, thanks for that question. It's a it's a real challenge um, when you're dealing with um, so many different potential you know sources of information coming in, and you're trying to judge the credibility of them and um, things like that. But I think that um, it's important to. I mean, if if you're talking to if you're talking to someone, I mean, again, this is like going back to the um, the audience, like who's your audience question. And so if this is a person who um, has genuine questions about what's going on with in the world um, when it comes to, to climate change and things like that. Like you want to have empathy for where they're coming from and the concerns that they have. So you want to make sure to listen to them and to listen to their concerns, right? Um, uh, important things to know when um, having these types of conversations is um, we bring um, all of all of this baggage with us to any kind of conversation. So, um, you know, the ideologies that we, um, you know, have have grown have developed and like grown up around and things like that, um, and um, the sort of um, people that we trust, the communities that we, you know, live and grew up in and work in and things like that, um, all sort of create this like framework for how we take in information. And so, um, really important things to think about are. Um, I mean, just sort of like, as you're trying to, um, share, um, uh, like factual information about like, you know, mainstream climate science, things like that, um, is to be effective in that communication. It's important. Research has shown that it's important to have, um, uh, like a clear message that's delivered um, consistently. So over and over again um, from a, a credible um, and reliable messenger, right? So it's someone that they trust, right? Are they hearing this message from um, their religious leader? Are they hearing it from uh, you know, a friend or relative? Are they hearing it from like people who they work with, that kind of a thing. Um, and so those are important things to keep in mind um, when trying to like, um, engage in effective science communication. Um, and that goes for any kind, you know, if it's about climate change or, um, you know, sort of any, any um, sort of subject there, but does that sort of answer your question or there, is there like a, you know, a more um, focused like angle of that, that you're, that you're interested in? Yeah, I know it's definitely a tough topic. So um, I, I feel like that did generally answer my question. And I think the most tangible takeaway for me from that is just making sure that those messages aren't just coming from me, but making sure that those messages are coming from people that they are already interacting with um, and that they already have in their sphere. So thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that, Rose. Austin, I see you have your hand up. Yes, thanks. Um, so my question is mostly towards, um, for Bellamy is for the, as you mentioned, we're a progressive area and it's been the, um, the push like carbon pricing measures or caps have like kind of been stalling out. And as someone who volunteered on the last I-1631 campaign for the carbon pricing, I've been on a few um, campaigns for um, state legislative offices. And it always kind of feels like the topic of carbon pricing is always kind of like backburnered during the whirlwind of the legislative session and always something more pressing comes up or along that lines. Do you think it's, um, there's a role for media to play in putting environmental topics on a political, on the political legislative agenda? And if it does, um, if it does have a role to play, do you think media should be playing a role of putting those type of um, topics on the agenda? Mm. That's interesting, sort of setting the agenda in a way, yeah. Well, I mean, I think, um, you know, we're choosing which stories to cover each day. And there are a lot of factors that go into that. And it's not like I get up in the morning and know that I can definitely, you know, set this agenda. <laughs> it, um, you know, it depends on a lot of factors, whether I'm able to cover that legislative hearing in that particular time. Um, and I, I confess, I, I tend to follow what politicians are doing. And in our state, our governor has been very forward on this. And so it is puzzling to me 
um, and I think you probably know more than I do about what happens in the legislative realm um, around that, but um, I, I do think that what we need to do right now is to point out the health effects of climate impacts and to let people of color and people who are low income who are are wanting to speak about this to give them voice and to let them lead with with that message and so that is something that i try to do on the days when i'm able to get to the carbon pricing story i mean i think i i i have to admit i hadn't really it's embarrassing in a way but it i needed to be reminded that when somebody purchases an offset and a company is given a permit to continue polluting where they've been polluting, that that affects neighborhoods and the money that is collected can go as far afield as Canada to address issues there. And so if I'm the guy living in the polluted neighborhood, that makes me angry. <laughs> and and that, that really is not okay. And, and um, it's important to, to give voice to that because we need a carbon policy and our people have shown us that if we don't get everyone at the table, it's not happening. And you know, we have to get oil on board too. So can we have a revenue neutral one somehow? Is there a way to do that? There's a bond measure that's under consideration now. I think that's pretty interesting. I'm watching the work of uh, Representative Lakenoff. Um, and some others around her um, who are working on this, but it, it is kind of astounding, isn't it, that we don't have a carbon pricing strategy yet? Um, yeah. But you know, we do need to we do need to be mindful of of the impacts. And and I again, I will say it again. You know, the roots of the environmental laws that we have, these landmark laws, are in human health. No one can argue that we don't want to be drinking chemicals when we drink our water. You know, that are going to harm our health or that, that we don't wanna be swallowing smog in our neighborhoods that makes us choke, whether it's wildfire smoke or, or anything else. Um, we don't want our rivers to be on fire. Everyone agrees about that. There's no question. So um, we, need to, we need to look at the health effects and, and they're happening. I mean, the state has a, you probably know this, there's a, um, an equity, health equity map that the state has started compiling. It's not entirely complete. There's a lot of data in there, and um, that's a gold mine for for bringing these things to light. Yeah, yeah I, I'm reminded of the the River Fire lobby. They might they might have a different view of that. I mean, some people must like River Fires, right? Um, anyway, uh, that that's really thank you so much for that, Bellamy. Really interesting, and it reminds me um, of something we talked about in class about stories. And, and so talking about carbon pricing, that strikes me as a relatively complicated story that is not necessarily, maybe it would be a little bit harder to capture an audience's attention than say something else. Like, you know, the natural disaster story, the oil spill or the, the wildfire that's happening right, right away, right, right, right now, very present. I, I'm, this is a question to all three of you. Is, do you find that there are some types of stories, especially maybe policy stories in particular, that are harder to tell? And what do you do in those situations? Well, I mean, I'll start and just say that, you know, policy stories, usually the, the policy is debated. And so um, for radio, which is short form, there's kind of a, you know, a back and forth that you can do or ways of kind of trying to unpeel that onion. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, one of the things I really struggle with are numbers in stories. I had to rewrite a news spot pretty radically recently because um, it was about a UW researcher who has some new, he's a statistician, Adrian, Raff, Adrian Raftery, um, has a new paper out about what we need to do to meet the goals in the Paris Accord. And um, I mean, depending on which country you're considering it from and which time frame, it's just hell. It's hell trying to convey that in a clear way. Um, 
And so, you know, then the default is to go, at least in radio storytelling, to go for the emotion um, and tell like the story arc as a, a way of providing a kind of a wave to, to get capture attention. And then people can go back and read the numbers in a web story, for example. So just really only touching the numbers very lightly. But I'd be curious to hear how Hannah and Ashley handle those. Yeah, either of you? Nobody wants to continue. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I guess it's a little bit of a different, um, a different perspective that I have, like not working for one particular you know, outlet um, and sort of being limited to that. So I have um, the opportunity as a freelance journalist to take stories um, to select audiences at particular publications that might be more willing to go deeper into the science or deeper into the numbers or things like that. Um, but even so, I mean, I um, definitely had to sell my editors at Hakai Magazine on certain um, of these um, stories about the arcane, you know, um, permitting policy and procedures of the pebble mine, um, where we're talking about compensatory mitigation plans to offset the impacts to salmon and to wetlands from, you know, these proposed, um, you know, the pr a proposed mine and all of the trappings that come with it. And, um, you know, and it's, it's important to um, to think about like connecting some of those developments and some of these harder to tell stories um, with, you know, why it matters and why it matters to, you know, maybe the reader specifically in some of these like broader issues, right? Um, but also, you know, making sure that you're, you're highlighting the voices of the people who are impacted by that, right? So speaking to um, the um, indigenous peoples who are subsistence users of the salmon and the commercial fishermen um, who livelihoods are connected to the salmon talking to, you know, obviously like talking to um, the scientists who are explaining um, the policy and the science behind, you know, how they make all these calculations and everything, but, um, but you know, still trying to, um, to connect it to that bigger picture for readers um, and, to, and to bring in those voices. Um, uh, to, to, to just sort of like tie those, um, tie those things together as much as possible. So. Yeah. <clears throat> um, Thank you. I really appreciate what Bellamy and Ashley are sharing just because, you know, you can see that there are so many different ways to do journalism and that it really often has to do with who's interpreting it or who's reading it. Our work only matters if people consume it and process it and share it and act on it. Um, so in my capacity as a reporter, when I run into issues that are complex, convoluted, um, full of jargon, really policy oriented and that are hard to stick a narrative on or at least a narrative that will capture people's attention, there's ways to extrapolate narratives that sit at the sidelines of those issues. So, um, you know, Bellamy mentioned whales um, <laughs> how to save whales is such a can of worms right now. Um, there are lots of people with conflicting ideas about how we should approach the policy around it. There's so much money at stake. There are so many moving parts. Um, but ultimately, you know, one way I decided to try to, um, add to this conversation without just getting buried in the weeds of policy is to look at, okay, the core issue that we're looking at here is that a species is struggling, right? The species orcas um, are reflective of the ways that we have really mistreated Puget Sound. Um, but when an orca is pregnant, because they're endangered, we get really excited about it. And so over the summer, you know, there was some news about pregnant orcas and how significant it was for this species to have something positive uh, going on. And I decided to look into, you know, how can we share with people what it means for an orca to struggle and the stakes of producing a new orca. So I looked into the science of uh, how orcas carry their children to term and just how unlikely it is 
for orcas to be able to actually birth and rear a baby, a calf through its first year. Um, so people can't necessarily agree on the ins and outs of exactly how you get to more whales, but you can capture people's attention by helping them appreciate just how difficult it is to produce more whales. And we don't have a lot of time to make the decisions necessary to provide them with an environment that they can do that in. It's already hard. Um, so, you know, for people who are arguing over some of the minutia of how to handle these policies, trying to zoom out and say, okay, do we have time to be, you know, splitting hairs? What do we need to do to give this animal a fighting chance was one way that I tried to approach a story like that. Yeah. And I just, for folks either on the, the Zoom or the YouTube, I, I believe I actually just shared the link for that story in the chat for anybody who's curious and, and wants to check it out. Um, well, I do want to make sure that I get to a question from someone on YouTube right now. Um, and this maybe can go out to anyone because I think it's actually a really interesting question. Um, this uh, Eric Young says, uh, what is the best way for a local environmental nonprofit with a potential story to capture your attention. I guess this could go for anyone who has a story that they feel like needs to be addressed or they, they feel like it, it, there is a story there. How, how, how do we capture your attention and tell you this is something that really should be covered without sounding like, um, you know? I, <laughs> I really want to jump in there. I want you to provide me with someone whose experience can illustrate the issue that you're talking to me about. I want to see that story, that policy, that issue that you say is so important through someone's lived experience. Um, so, you know, I, I am really lucky to work for a publication that allows me to focus on um, features. You know, I'm not doing the day-to-day -day, uh, news of what politicians are saying, which is incredibly important. And I often wouldn't be able to do my work without being able to cite that kind of stuff. But um, I tend to respond to, uh, um, organizations that can show me that they're not just writing a press release about a policy issue that they're passionate about, but they can show me that someone in my community is currently experiencing the detriments of that issue right now. Um, and I tend to respond more um, to organizations that can show me how different demographics are experiencing an issue differently, especially marginalized groups. I think I would be remiss not to note that even right now, you know, we are a panel of white women speaking to you about environmental reporting. And um, I think it's so important to, you know, if this is who I am to be using my bully pulpit to, you know, raise the voices of people who are most affected by the issues that I'm often writing about. Um, so I try to, I, I try to respond often to, people who are showing me how everybody is negatively impacted, but some people are negatively impacted in very meaningful ways that are not addressed. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, that's, that's, that's great. Um, let's move on to another question real quickly. Here's one uh, from Georgia. Uh, and by the way, folks, if, folks on the Zoom, if you have questions you'd like to ask directly, please feel free to raise your hand. You can ask them yourself. Uh, but here's one from Georgia. Um, uh, and this is about pursuing a career in environmental journalism. Um, and, and maybe actually now would be a good time for me to start a poll. And maybe while I'm doing this, you can ask, you can answer this question. So um, here's the poll, which is about for folks who are thinking about careers in environmental or environmental or science. Uh, communication or journalism. Um, why don't you go ahead and, and answer this poll question for us? Um, and while we're while we're answering the poll question for our panelists, um, you all have very different backgrounds, which I think is really awesome and exciting. Um, and, and so the question is, um, if you're for someone who wants to pursue uh, a career in environmental journalism. Um, what advice do you have for them, uh, especially in a situation where they might not necessarily have a lot of the background? Do you find that not having the background um, or, or reporting on things where you're not necessarily an expert, is that, is that a challenge? And how do you work around that? 
Well, I anyone can take that. I, I think I have the least background in environmental science. So um, for me as a radio communicator, it's actually an asset. Um, you know, I've picked up, you have to have a basic sense of what is an ecosystem and, you know, just sort of the basics of, of the components of an environment to be on the beat, but that's picked up pretty quickly. But yeah, some of the science stuff can be tricky. So um, I've done some training over the years, but really I have to explain it to an audience that I cannot assume knows the material. So um, in a way it's better that I don't know that much because it forces the people I'm talking to, the scientists, to bring it down to the level of a layperson. And it doesn't mean dumbing the story down completely. I'm hopefully intelligent enough to, you know, pick up some of that and convey it in a not too stupid sounding way. Um, but, you know, it's, it's clear, it's maybe clearer when that scientist is talking to me than if they're talking to someone who's been trained in their field and, you know, so they slip into acronyms and things like that. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And Thank you. just a, a real quick uh, to, to add on to that. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, with any, any, story that you're reporting, like no matter how well you think you know a beat, like there are always going to be, you know, issues that come up or angles that come up or things like that, that you just, I mean, you, you can't know everything. And I mean, you know, science in the environment can be so broad and so, um, and, and also so specific that a key, um, you know, um, ability and, um, and, and just like expertise that you have to develop as a journalist and as an effective communicator is the ability to ask questions and to keep asking them and to not to assume that you understand things um, as you're asking those questions and, and interviewing people, um, but, you know, making sure that you're talking to the right people um, and reading as much as you can to try to understand things better, but, um, you know, just making sure that you are defining those terms and, um, you know, and repeating back. So I hear you saying this, am I getting this right? Um, and then, you know, that can really help make sure that you're not um, missing things or misunderstanding things. And I mean, I think that's just a, an all around like really essential skill to be able to ask those questions um, of whoever, you know, whoever you're speaking to um, and listening, yeah. listening to that answer. <laughs> There's the joke in journalism, you know, if your if your mother says she loves you, check it out. Um, <laughs> ourselves of that, it's, you know, you cannot you cannot assume anything that you're putting into print. Yeah, good, good, thank you. Um, I I really appreciate what Bellamy and Ashley shared, and agree with both of them wholeheartedly. Um, I think you know something that you have to accept when you go into this field is you know if you're a perfectionist like. It's, it's going to be hard for you. Like I, I am someone who likes to get things right. I thrive on feeling, you know, competence and expertise. And what you have to realize is that you don't dilute the value of your work by recognizing that the whole purpose of you doing your work is to go to people who know more than you. Um, you know, they might not necessarily understand the application or the impact of their work in a specific way for a specific community. But the reason that we talk to experts is because they have, you know, their, their primary sources. They're the people who understand these things best. Um, and also you have to understand that your work sits within a body of work. Not every single story you produce, I'm like really speaking to myself when I'm saying this, not every story you produ produce has to be a magnum opus. You know, you have time to keep idiating, to keep pushing. And oftentimes when you peel back one layer, you know, your audience has a 30 second attention span. They're not going to sit down and read a book or listen, listen to an audio novella. You know, you can give people stories in bite sized pieces and allow them the room and the mental space to process that one thing that you're giving them and then allow them time to keep digging and put the pieces together. Um, putting information out there, oftentimes, uh, that's how you build a beat. You do one story on something, someone tells you why they think you're wrong and you say, please tell me how I'm wrong, what don't I know? And then you go down that rabbit hole. Um, so just realizing that people often have more grace for you than you have for yourself and allowing yourself to keep learning is so important. And like Ashley said, the most important resource that you have is your curiosity and your ability to figure out which questions to ask. 
Yeah. Well, thank you for that. I'll share the results of the poll just right now so you can see. The question was, what is your biggest concern about becoming a science or environmental communicator? And uh, it looked like, for the most part, misinformation and impact was a big part of that. I guess that's kind of two things, really, the way that I have it worded there. So uh, there's obviously there's the issue of misinformation in general and sort of the impact that anyone can have, whether it's through misinformation or correct information. Um, Josh, do you want to uh, ask a question of our panel? I so do. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so it's directed to Ashley, but I think everybody has an avenue to answer it in their own right. Um, I was reading your writing and you referenced Claire Wardell and a specific quote was that the most dangerous conspiracy theories are those that have kernels of truth. And, and it's, it, it really ties into what you've been practicing, which is fact checking. And it makes me question who has the burden of proof when it comes to dismantling misinformation, especially online. That's a huge question. Who has the burden? I mean, there are like, again, is it like the social media companies who are helping, um, you know, facilitate the proliferation of some of this misinformation? Is that the news organizations, um, you know, are the, I think it goes to a number of levels of responsibility. I think we all uh, need to have some sort of personal responsibility for, um, you know, the type of information that we're consuming. Um, understanding where that information comes from, um, you know, um, being more informed about the um, where we accept um, information. Obviously, it's easy to to Photoshop things and screenshots that seem to be, you know, sharing this type of um, you know proof of something happening um, can quickly get shared around um, the internet, and there can be fake. Um, uh, you know, fake social media accounts and things like that. And this, you know, I think com comes up um, in the uh, in that uh, slate story that you're referencing where I was writing about the collision of misinformation, climate science denial, um, and the, the West Coast wildfires um, uh, from the fall and summer. And um, I'm, yeah, <laughs> it's, there's, there's a lot there. And uh, I don't know that I have all of the answers for that, but I think, it, it, you know, we, as individual consumers of, of news and information need to hold ourselves, our communities and our, you know, our news organizations and, you know, elected leaders. I mean, I just think at all levels, like we really need to be holding people accountable for the information that they're sharing and challenging, like, what do you know? How do you know it? Um, and it's hard. Uh, it, it's, I mean, you, it's, it's really, it's a difficult thing to do and you sometimes have to go really deep um, and talk to a lot of people and dig, you know, down into the weeds in order to, to get um, at what's really, what's really going on. But yeah. Yeah, it's a tough one. Any, anybody else have thoughts on that question? Um, more generally on misinformation or how you <laughs> police who gets to share information. Um, I think that the more reflection we do on the sources of our information and whose voices we are centering, um, the better shot we have at getting a fuller picture of which information has um, you know, experiential or scientific backing behind it and which information is more emotional. Um, and then you can drill down into why is this information provoking such an emotional response? What are the motivations that people have for sharing this emotional response? Um, I think that something that I, I like to do is go through when I'm reading something and see, you know, what are the backgrounds of the people who are sharing this information? Who am I allowing to shape my worldview? Are there people from marginalized groups who are, you know, treated as expert sources? Are they constantly treated as, you know, victims or are they, you know, like, is the person who's presenting you with a plea using people or centering people? Um, mm -hmm. I usually find that people who tokenize groups don't have their best interests at heart. And that can be really telling when it comes to climate issues too. Thank you for that. 
Um, I, so I have opened up another poll for those of you in the Zoom, and, and this is a question that Bellamy was interested in knowing the answer to. So I figured I'd uh, post it before we say our goodbyes, because I want to make sure that the maximum number of people actually look this question over. Uh, we'll have a, a couple more questions uh, before we close tonight. And so I want to make sure that I get to a couple more of these. Here's one that I thought was actually very interesting, and it's for Hannah. Um, specifically, but I think that, that, that uh, Ashley and Bellamy might want to take a crack at it as well. And that is, um, in, okay, in the, in, the con okay, in the constant rigmarole, by the way, I love the word rigmarole. Thank you for using that. The constant rigmarole of COVID-19 information that is reported every day. How do you work to stand apart from the rest? In addition, how do you ensure that important environmental issues don't get lost in the shuffle of the pandemic, we, we we talked a little bit in class about the sort of the shrinking news hole and the, the fact that people's attention it's it's hard to capture that with all the sources of information that are out there. Um, so maybe we can start with you, Hannah, uh, and I'm going to share a link to your story um, that that you talked about with me or with uh, with our group earlier. I'm going to share that, uh, but why don't you go ahead and take a crack at the question as well? Um, I think being an environmental reporter actually helps my COVID work stand out. Um, you know, disease is environmental. And when you try to evaluate the way that disease exists in an environment, you come across stories that you might not get just by focusing on policy issues. Um, and uh, also, you know, infectious disease research is a science. So I think I'm actually in a pretty good position to find angles that relate to, you know, the types of frameworks that I usually think about. Um, but because I'm not doing, you know, day-to-day -day chasing of new information, uh, which as I mentioned is super important, you know, there's a, a huge creativity in figuring out how to source information. Like I respect the heck out of that. And it's something that I aspire to do in my work, but I also like to focus on the way that people are reacting to and applying the information that we're finding about the disease. So, you know, when people were concerned about fomites, um, surfaces on which uh, diseases can exist and maybe transfer between people, or not diseases, but the viruses that produce them um, can transfer between people, I focused on people who are trying to figure out the extent to which that was an issue in interesting ways. And um, there's some sources that I had uh, interacted with for previous work, I ended up getting connected with a woman who was stranded in Seattle, uh, who focuses on infectious disease and environmental sampling, and just decided that she was going to sample surfaces where she found herself, where she found herself stranded. And that became a whole story of, you know, kind of resilience in science. So you find people on the edges of the news who are trying to look at things from different, often forward-looking perspectives, trying to parse, okay, this is what we think we know right now. Why don't we know it? Um, and the stakes of not knowing that and how it affects your life. Like I talked with her in that story about what her work as a scientist meant for her relationships with people um, and what it meant for your work to all of a sudden be thrust into, you know, the most important spotlight on the planet. Um, so I, I really don't think that there's a way to avoid finding stories that stand out no matter what kind of reporter you are. Like there, this is affecting everyone. You know, there, there is no way we're gonna be able to cover all the stories of the pandemic ever. And then to the point about not losing environmental coverage in the midst of this, um, you know, that's just the hazard of, of doing my job. You know, I, I try to keep tabs on as much as possible. I'm constantly emailing sources to say, hey, what are you doing now other than sitting your sitting in your house waiting to do your research? Like, maybe that's the story. Like at the beginning of the pandemic, I did, I did a piece about like how much we have to lose with field science because of the fact that people couldn't do their work or couldn't access their instruments in the field. Um, but, you know, I, I do realize that I've one person. I can't report out everything that's happening, which is why I'm so appreciative that there are, are more journalists out there right now, oftentimes who are more explicitly focused on very narrow environmental beats. You know, I, I am a generalist, um, but there are people like, you know, Ashley, who has 
a whole um, depth of knowledge specifically about, you know, climate misinformation and, uh, you know, issues with, with carbon and global warming. So she is going to be keeping much deeper tabs on that than I am right now when a large portion of my job is figuring out how vaccines work <laughs> or don't work. Um, it, we, we really, like, we work for different publications, but we work together to create as broad a view of the what's going on as possible. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I, I included a link in the chat to uh, that story you shared about uh, the pandemic and how it might set science back. So I thought that was an, a really interesting one there. And I saw, Ashley, that you also provided a link to a story about climate science denial, misinformation, and wildfires, which I have taken subsequently and put in the chat on YouTube. So it's, everybody has access to that now. Um, well, anybody else want to uh, take a crack at that that question in closing? I, we're we're going to have to wrap it up, I think, pretty quickly, just to be respectful of everyone's time. So we're answering the question about um, keeping um, environment issues alive during the pandemic and not. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I agree with Hannah. My situation's a little bit different. We have a pretty a uh, tight team of folks and, you know, I am the environment reporter. I can never cover everything. Um, and so, yeah, looking for interesting angles on the pandemic. For me, we have people who focus more on health and science. And so I tend to be more, um, more looking at indigenous groups, for example. Um, so, and I'm getting better and better sourced up there. So I was able to very quickly turn a story, for example, about um, vaccine hesitancy among specifically among indigenous groups, urban indigenous groups, um, and got some some pretty fast callbacks on that one evening, which was really nice. Um, and I think when I do stories during the pandemic that are not directly related, um, my sense is that my colleagues and the audience really like that because we're just so bombarded with so much pandemic news. Or some of my stories might be kind of sort of related, like that clamming story that I shared, the pandemic's in it. I mean, it's, you can't deny that it's going on, that everything's closed down. And, um, but the, at the very end, there's a quote um, from the state official, basically acknowledging how much he wishes that he could open the clamming season because of the pandemic and the emotional outlet that it kind of represents if people would be allowed to engage in that culture. But they can't, you know, and so you kind of get at it in, in slightly different ways. Or I'm reminded of a story that just came up, you know, trolling the beat, um, listening to different science panels and chancing upon a really good one that included some local people. So I was able to sell it as a local story, but it was about um, uh, Glacier Bay, I wanna say, um, where whales are suddenly way more active because it's quiet. <laughs> Um, wow, imagine that, you know, and just the, the fascination with, you know, what this pandemic is showing us um, about our normal levels of activity and what happens when we slow down. Yeah. Um, I know we're short on time, but I do want to add, Bellamy made me think about it. Um, I think that the pandemic really provides us with an opportunity to make environment stories even more important. Um, I had the support of my editors this past fall, early in the fall, um, to work with some of my teammates on a package about how people are trying to remake society to, to be more sustainable, to be more equitable in the wreckage of this pandemic. Um, and the fact that the pandemic has really made us stay closer to home, made us really appreciate our immediate surroundings. Um, it makes it easier to engage people in stories about the way that we work with the world, I guess. And, you know, Be Bellamy's point about um, connections between habitual things that we do in our environments, like clamming, really are affected by the pandemic. And it's really making everyone reevaluate the way that we live. Um, so I think this is a great time to pitch all the stories that you have about the environment and how a life upended by the pandemic can make us reflect on how we do things and how we do them better and who gets to do things. Yeah, thank you for that. 
Well, y'all, I've just realized what time it is, uh, and I appreciate everyone sticking around as long as you all have, but uh, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. And so I'm going to just thank our guests again for being with us today. Uh, just a big round of virtual applause for these great speakers today. Thank you for sharing your wisdom with us and your expertise and your knowledge. We, we really, um, really appreciate it. Uh, for those of you joining us online, as always, you can watch this uh, seminar and our previous seminars on YouTube. Those are all under our Conversations in Environmental Communication series. Please check those out. Please subscribe to our channel. Hit the little bell icon and you'll be notified the next time we go live or the next time we up, uh, upload new material. Um, and we'll see you next week for another edition of Conversations in Environmental Communication.